I can talk to anyone and anything. My friends will attest to that. Like, yeah. I just enjoy people, so. Look, you got a little Southern in you then. Really? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, we, my grandma's from Fayetteville, so. We talk to anybody. Like, yeah, you do. <laughs> I used to hate it, though. I, like, my dad would talk to, like, everyone and, like, go into, like, the grocery store, and it would take, oh, like, an normal. hour and a half. Yeah. And I'm like, can we just get this thing and leave? I used to hate it, too, because my mom did it, and, like, she loved talking to people, and she also just said random small talk that like you didn't need to do, but now I do it all the time. all the time. And like my boyfriend will point it out, he's like, why did you just say that in the supermarket to the cashier? I'm like, I don't know, like I just wanna make small talk, and normally they don't wanna talk to me. <laughs> like, I just say, oh, like are these onions always like this? Like why am I asking this? Just like get yeah. your stuff and go. Yeah. But um, I just really enjoy human mm -hmm. interaction, and I think living in LA, I miss it. I didn't realize how much I did it in New York without thinking about it. What is it about, so you know, it's funny because Chris and Beffy mentioned it and you're mentioning it. What's the difference between running into to people from your perspective in New York or the Bronx and like versus like here? I feel like in New York, you can't avoid like the sharing of energy. Like at any point, any point, you're passing people, you're walking by people, you're commuting with people, like you're always in a shared space of yeah. being with people. And so because of that, you're just constantly interacting and talking to people, like people say hello to each other, people curse at each other, like people, <laughs> like you you know everybody, you're familiar with like your neighborhood a lot of times. So mm -hmm. I feel like growing up, it's just natural for you from the moment you wake up to when you go home that you're like interacting, interacting. with people. Yeah. And here it's, it's not like that. Like you can be in your car all day, drive mm. to Target, drive to the supermarket, drive, I don't know, anywhere yeah. and not see people, which is amazing <laughs> when that's what you want. Yeah. But I think sometimes I took for granted that like shared energy mm. with people because I feel like that's where I, I get a lot of my inspiration from. Yeah, from just people. But it's also, I would say, it's the transportation thing too. Like yeah. you pointed out, it's like here, West Coast in general, I feel like it's more, you spend more time in your car East Coast, you got a lot of these public yeah. transportation systems where it's subways or buses and you just, you have to be connected to people. Yeah, I mean, I took the train every single day from mm -hmm. when I was 14, because I started at high school, I had to go to school in Harlem, I went to school in the Bronx, so I had yeah. to take the six train. And I took the train every single day of my <laughs> life. And now, I was home like a month ago and I was on the train shook. Like there Wait, was- Wait, why? Well, I think, at, like, when the pandemic hit, I lived in New York, we weren't taking the subway, like, we were avoiding uh, it, yeah. right? Because we were so congested, I felt mm -hmm. like, and it was like, you know, it was so not the norm, and everybody was on high alert, so I just kind of stopped taking public transportation, mm -hmm. and then I moved here. So I haven't really been hmm. on, like, the train yeah. since the pandemic, <laughs> and I was scared shitless can i curse yeah okay <laughs> i was so scared just like re and then i was like how was i interacting with people yeah. every single day taking day. the train at Not like 3 a.m like sitting next to people talking to people and it was just a wild experience mm -hmm. and my friends were like what is wrong with you yeah. like why are you acting so weird but i think when i would be on the train i would like people watch and i would mm -hmm. take pictures on my phone and i would mm -hmm. get like ideas or like oh this could be a cool story mm -hmm. or like who is this person and make up like these ideas in my head of like even mini movies mm. of like people I was seeing. That's dope. So now when I'm here, I'm like, well, how do I do that mm. here? What does that look like here? Yeah, you gotta figure out how you can get more of that interaction and curation. Yeah. But it's just kind of natural. When Which is why I always talk to Uber drivers here. Because <laughs> they always have a story. I do, I feel like Uber drivers should have like, there should be a series. Like I feel oh. like every Uber driver should probably have a podcast just well, because of the stories. <laughs> we need no more podcasts. <laughs> You're, but like, you're like, I'm done with that. <laughs> here, I think like Uber drivers here are all like chasing a dream. Well, yeah, they're also like, they're not just doing that. Yeah, like yeah. in New York, they're like old cab, old cab, cab drivers, like taxi drivers, mm -hmm. like that's what they've always done. I got an Uber and there was like a guy, he was like 50 years old. He heard me on the phone talking about work, saw my Pelican, Mm -hmm. oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh, you're ready to sell the Pelican. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm a photographer. I direct. He's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm writing a movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm making music. He played me his demo. He told me he got signed. And like, I know most people get annoyed, but I was like really inspired that this like, so then I started telling him. <laughs> you told me your story. Because <laughs> I was really inspired that he was like 50 plus, yeah. had like adult kids, mm -hmm. and was just like, 
still chasing still his, thing. his dream here and then doing Uber. I was I mean, like, this is great. Because you never know. I mean, like, yeah, I think I, I try to remind people of, like, Dapper Dan. Dapper right. Dan's having a moment that he didn't he, he didn't have. Yeah, he had an incredible moment, like, you know, in, like, in Harlem. Don't get me wrong. Like, that's a big moment as well. Now he's having this moment on a global scale, and Dap's in his 70s. Yeah, and everybody, all the new generation of people that get to discover him for the first mm -hmm. time, and, mm -hmm. like, they feel like, oh, like, this was my generation, and then the older people were like, whoa. They're like, like nah. <laughs> but that's, like, beautiful. I think that as, I mean, maybe it's because, like, we're getting older, so yeah. I think as you get older, you start to appreciate, like, mm -hmm. age and wisdom mm -hmm. more because, like, you're not a spring chicken anymore <laughs> and you don't want to be forgotten. But I think the idea that people can be passionate about something in art or something they love their whole lives mm -hmm. and never give up is really cool. I think that's dope. I, it, it, I also think it's different now, especially when you think about the generation before us that was our age. There was always this thought around, like, you're gonna retire, or this is a young person's game. Yeah. You can't do this forever. And I feel like a lot of creatives are changing that. Like, oh, it's, yeah, it's like, no, I'm gonna do this until I decide I don't wanna I'm do like, this anymore. <laughs> you sold us on the 401k, don't need it. <laughs> I was like, I wanna be this age retiring, yeah. Yeah. and I wanna be old working. But I think it's like, one, we have like way more accessibility to things that we love. Yeah. And two, I think you start to see the older generations, like they're not fulfilled, mm -hmm. right? Because they were worried that they only could do it when they were young mm -hmm. and then they're older and they're not like rediscovering their passions or they're bored or, and, or they get super lonely. Yeah. And it's like, well, what is like, what is our whole point of being on this earth and living if we're not like passionate about something? About what we're doing. About what we're doing. So I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> People are like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I want to be a photographer till I'm 95. Like, <laughs> what will I be shooting? I don't know. I don't know. I could be shooting kindergartners at that point. <laughs> but, like, I don't think I ever have to stop unless something yeah. stops me. From, from doing yeah. what you're doing. Um, take me back to the Bronx. Growing up in the Bronx, um, as a child, you know, you're surrounded by community. And um, as you were saying, like, people and all this engagement. Um, what experience of empathy and, and joy do you still hold on to from growing up there? Um, I would say that that's just like my overall, like if you had like a little pot and you put stuff in, it'd be like <laughs> empathy, <laughs> <laughs> joy, and I would hope like a sense of humor, but, yeah. and then some creativity. But I mm -hmm. think um, growing up in the Bronx made me super empathetic mm. and super self-aware mm. as well. How so? Um, I think it's a mix of like class, mm. um, there's different races, different ethnicities, there's just, we're all in a space together, very, very close, you know? Yeah. Um, and you need your community. Yeah. Like I think that I come from a really small family, mm. like I was like basically raised by a single parent home, it was just me and my mom. Mm -hmm. I have an older brother, but he was like 18 years older than me, so mm -hmm. he was in the army, so yeah. he didn't grow up with us. My dad lived in North Carolina wow. and would like drive up, you know, when he wanted to drive up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do his like drive up the 95 when he felt like it. Yeah. Um, and so growing up my whole life, it was just me and my mom. And wow. then everybody I grew up with who were like my first friends who are now still my adult friends mm -hmm. because we grew up in the same neighborhood and yeah. our parents are friends. Yeah. and. Their, their grandma's like considered my grandma because my grandma lives in North Carolina yeah. and we take care of each other. Of you know, course. you like grow up outside. I always say that it's kind of like Hey Arnold because <laughs> <laughs> we just grew up outside. Yeah. You know, like Blackout 2003, we were outside. I don't even remember there being a blackout beyond knowing that know. because we were outside the whole day no, or no. like, you know, our parents, my mom would be like, go outside and, you know, Bianca's mom is going to watch you all day. <laughs> so it's like you build that community. You have to take care of each other. You look yeah. out for one another and you struggle together. And yeah. I think through struggling together, you mm. also have a lot of empathy. Yeah. And then you tie that into, I think my mom was like a super empathetic person. And mm. she always told me like, you don't look down on people. Mm. We're all the same. You never judge somebody when they're going through something. It could be you. So mm. all that fundamentally growing up made me super empathetic. I also think I'm super emotional mm. and sensitive to other people's emotions. And so, 
I think that all stemmed from the Bronx and yeah. being there. Like, I wouldn't want to grow up anywhere else. I also just feel like we have an amazing roster. Everybody from the Bronx is great. Look, like, look at it. I mean, y'all do be representing. I can't front. We go so hard for each other. Like, I feel like when people are like, where are you from? I'm like, the Bronx. Mm -hmm. You're like, New York? I'm like, the Bronx. Like, mm -hmm. I want it to I be known. Be specific. Yeah, because I think sometimes we've been counted out. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of pressure, you know? Mm -hmm and like making it or what does that look like to be successful and I think for me because I'm still so tied to the Bronx and like my family and friends live there mm -hmm. I'm hyper aware of the struggles that still exist yeah. you know so I feel like it helps me not take things for granted and keep me grounded mm -hmm. in like where I am in life where I want to be but also like what is my purpose mm -hmm. coming from here what do I represent like how can I help other people and push it forward yeah I love it. You gotta. You really gotta be passionate about where you're from. You know what I mean. It's, it's what makes you. It's what gives you who you are. Your edge. Your your approach to things. I think that's really dope. And I also think, and this could just be personal to me, but I think that because, like, I didn't have a real tie to my parents' like ethnic backgrounds because they grew up in like respectively New York and the South that like the Bronx is really my cultural identity. Mm. You know, like some people are like, I'm a New Yorker and that's really what it is, you mm. know? Like my mom has Italian heritage, but I didn't grow up in Italy. We don't speak Italian, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the most Italian is that we watch The Godfather. It's like, <laughs> we eat spaghetti, but it's like, I don't have those cultural mm. ties. So all of my personal cultural ties a lot of times come from the Bronx. The Bronx. Hmm. Um, now I know today you occupationally identify as a photographer, but that wasn't the first thing no. that you really were into, but you were into like engineering and architecture and theater. I've had a million jobs. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really have. I worked so much. Um, I love to tell people my first job ever was at Carvel. Uh, I worked there for a week and they fired me at 14 because what? I, what I couldn't do? write on the cake. I'm left-handed. Oh. So like I would write on it and I would smudge it. <laughs> I really feel like I learned <laughs> so much about myself working there at 14. But um, I went to high school for engineering, mm -hmm. high school for math, science, and engineering, and architecture mm -hmm. um, in City College in New York. It was like a specialized school. You took a test to get in. Yeah. Really cool. <laughs> um, and when I went there, I wanted to do either architecture or engineering. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Before that, I wanted to be like a forensic scientist. That was like in at the time when we were growing up. Yeah. And then, so I did that. I took photography there okay. in like my junior year and fell in love with it and mm. was like, oh, I really like this. Yeah. I don't want to go to college for it, mm. um, but I do want to do it in some capacity. Yeah. So it was, I was more creative. You're yeah. holding on to it a little well, bit. Well, I think also I was like, it, I think at the time everyone said like, don't go get a creative degree, right? It mm. wasn't cool yet mm. and yeah. it wasn't safe. It was, that was, that was more like, it was cool, my mom it was like, safe. Yeah, it was like, I don't know how you're going to get yeah. paid to do this. Yeah, she was this. like, well, you love photography, but, like, do marketing, you know, do advertising. <laughs> that has photography. And I was like, oh, good idea. Yeah. Um, but along the lines, when I was 14, I started working. So from then on, every year, <clears throat> I worked at, like, a sign shop. Mm. I worked at Urban Outfitters. Mm -hmm. I, I did, like, I was a math tutor for K-8 to for one year. Wow. I, like, gave, helped with taxes. And then, like, I worked at a real estate company. Mm -hmm property management and yep. stuff. It was wild. We Worked at a hair a salon, like things. doing reception. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was like chasing a check. Trying to, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, we gotta try to get it somehow. Right. I, I remember I was working at like an insurance company when I was like 15. Did and you it like, like it? scarred me. Oh. And just, I was like, I was bored out of my mind. Well, I, was, I like, hated like do? every job I did <laughs> for, uh, one, like, it was just, I loved working with people and I loved trying new things. But I was like, this isn't for me. This yeah. isn't for me. I did theater from when I was like nine to 15. Mm -hmm. So in the summer, I was like a part of a theater troupe. Yeah. And we would do like Shakespeare. Yeah. We did a musical one at <laughs> Botanical Gardens. Yes. And I discovered that like, I don't want to do that. But again, I liked telling stories. Of so course. I was like, okay, that like helped bring me out of my shell. That I was like a it. shy kid. Mm. Uh, and so then from like 18, when I fell in love with photography, 17, 18, I was like doing it on the side. Yeah. And, but I had like all my day jobs. Mm -hmm. So I would like shoot on the weekends. Mm. I would shoot after work. Oh. I would pretty much like shoot anything my friends were doing. I would shoot any like music show in New York that was free that I can get into or get access to. Yeah. And as I was doing that, I was like, oh, I really, this is like something I'm really passionate about. 
I want to do this. Like, I really want to do this. So when I was 25, I quit my day job. And, and that's what it was. And that's what it was. But there's also a story about a photo of a flower, yeah? Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> when I was like 16, 17, I took photography in school. The fr you know, the first, they have you like take photos. Like, all right, take your first photo. Mm. And so, you know, it's like discovering like a macro lens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody has a flower shot. Everyone. I feel like every photographer has like <laughs> one of their first photos is like a flower shot on a macro lens that's like kind of blurry in the back and like <laughs> the front is in focus and then we had to basically go on Photoshop but at the time it was like J Paint Shop or something mm -hmm. and color it and edit it and alter it and I was like blown away mm -hmm. and I was like super inspired by it so I was like oh I'm good at this yeah. and I remember my teacher who to this day he wrote to me on Facebook mm -hmm. he was like he kept the class going because he saw how enthusiastic I was and wow. like they were gonna get rid of it after my mm -hmm. year and he was like no let's keep it yeah. and I was like oh wow See? maybe he's lying but <laughs> it's a good story in my <laughs> in my story so yeah I so did that's that. how it was okay so then when you so you said you knew like you got into 25 and you were having all these experiences with photography and you're like, this is what I want to do. But you were also in school at that time as well, right? So kind of, not really. Mm. My, that story is also really interesting and I love to tell it because I feel like I've read so many things about my college career and my life and mm. they never add up. you like, this Even ain't it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm like, I love to talk about it because I think it's not unique and I feel like a lot of people go through it. So I got a full-time scholarship to NYU. Yeah. Um, I was in Steinhardt for media, culture, and communications. Mm -hmm. And so my whole academic life, I've been like a straight-A student, mm -hmm. honor roll, principal's list, awards, you name it. And then I got to college. <laughs> and one, I thought it would be way easier than, it, than mm -hmm. it was. But also, I had gotten a job at Urban Outfitters where I was working when I wasn't in class, mm -hmm. and I was going out. You know, mm -hmm. like, I was, like, like going I'm to CMJ to Fest yeah. and, like, shooting concerts or, like, trying to shoot J. Cole at SOBs <laughs> or you know, trying to shoot Big Shaw, and I was like, just, I was really getting mm. and falling in love with photography, so I felt like I was doing it a lot of my free time, mm -hmm. and then I was like, super uninterested in school. It was getting in the way. It was getting in the way, and I, I had a bad advisor, so I didn't, I was taking really great mm -hmm. classes, but they were for like, juniors and seniors, when I should have just been doing like, English and math. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, taking like, photography classes, I'm taking like, black studies, I'm doing all these things, but they're a little advanced, they're hard, mm -hmm. So I'm challenged, and then I don't want to do it. I'm uninterested because I want to do photography. Yeah, do so when I was like, it was like the end of sophomore year into junior year. I might have been the first semester of junior year. I dropped out, which was like insane to tell my mom that I was, gonna, I was literally about to ask you I was like what did your mom think about oh my this? god well it's like my drive I think that is what drove me more than anything mm -hmm. because I felt so bad I felt like it was the first time in my life I had disappointed her mm -hmm. and disappointed this idea that she had for me and for us because mm -hmm. I felt like up until that time she worked so hard on me to make sure I was successful you get to this point you get a full scholarship and you're throwing it away yeah and I was devastated. I mean, I was devastated till now. Like I was talking about in therapy <laughs> last year. I, like I had to do a whole work through because yeah. I felt like I was holding on to it. Yeah. And it kind of made me feel and carry like I made bad decisions. Hmm. Even though I'm at a point in my career where I'm successful yeah. and I made the right choice. Like I wouldn't probably be here had I not taken every step. Mm -hmm. But I still held on to it like I kind of failed myself by not finishing it. So mm. I. Any time when I put myself into photography, I was like, I have to be successful. Like, mm. I have to prove it to my mom. You have to prove it to your mom. I have to prove, prove it to, to myself. Mm. Yeah, like, I had to be like, look, like, I made the right decision, I promise you. But also, beyond making the right decision, like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, it's okay to not finish school. Yeah. And I was really disappointed. And I, mm. I don't judge anybody else, but mm. I was judging myself Yourself. for it. Mm. So I dropped out of school. Mm -hmm. Then <laughs> I had the idea because I felt so bad. <laughs> Maybe I should go to a community college for a year. Oh, oh Listen, get my grades up and maybe go back to school, which is wild. I was in NYU, right? Yeah. So then for a semester, maybe a semester and a half, I went to Hostos Community College. And then I was like the smartest person. <laughs> and then I was upset at that because I was, but I learned again, I had to, it really taught me about like my own self-awareness and where I measured myself because mm. it was like, 
I think sometimes academically you can think you're better than people or think mm -hmm. you're smarter, and that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, I met some of the smartest people I had ever well, met that I'm still friends with today there. Yeah. And so I, I was challenged in a different way of mm -hmm. like not having an ego mm -hmm. and like doing well. But yeah. then I was like, I don't want to do this. And I was like, well, I left the place I wanted to go. <laughs> I'm at a place I don't want to be, and again, I still don't want to be in school. <laughs> so I left that, and then I was just like, okay, I'm done. You're like, I'm really done with this. I'm really done with it. Mm. And then, yeah, hmm. and so here I am. What did, so when you left the second time, what was, what was the conversation with, with your mom? My mom at this point is like, I don't know, what are you doing? Hmm. Like, you, why? Like, why don't you want to finish school? And I was mm -hmm. like, I just, I'm telling you, it's not for me. Like, I, I want to do photography. I want to work. I, I like, financially, I want to work. I'm starting now at this point, because we grew up really poor, that like, I'm making, you know, decent money and yeah. I'm kind of transitioning into being head of household. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, this isn't mm -hmm. helping me. Like, being in class is, I can be working. I can yeah. be doing a shoot. Mm -hmm. And like, my mom was really, tough but yeah. she's very understanding so yeah. she would just be like okay well then prove it like if that's what you want to do if you're mm. going to do photography then like do it wow. do it a hundred percent do it all the time and like don't give up mm. you can't quit at it mm. it's going to get hard and you have to be successful at it Ooh, she put that battery yeah <laughs> she is not for the week yeah. like it was like do it yeah and so I think because of that, I was like, there's nothing else I can do. Like, I have mm -hmm. to have tunnel vision. This isn't something I can give up. Mm -hmm. And it's something I love. So it's like, why would I give it up? Yeah. And the first couple years of working for myself and being like freelance, that was really my driving force. Like, I took any job because mm -hmm. I just wanted to show my mom show that I could mom. make money, mm -hmm. that we would not mm -hmm. be homeless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then I was gonna be good. Cause not only did I quit school, then I quit a regular day job. <laughs> then she's like, okay, so what is the pay system like? She's it's like, like you gotta explain this to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'll get paid in a month. And she's like, well, when are you getting paid for this? <laughs> like a month, 60 days. 60 days, yep. So it, it was a lot in the beginning. It was a lot to like explain and, and you know, your mom, that, that, that wasn't the world that she necessarily was in, right? So right. she didn't understand a lot of these things and you're having to like instill confidence and faith in her that. I'm gonna make this work. I'm gonna figure this out, right? So take me into like July 2nd, 2015. Right. Um, I believe that's the last time you ever worked for someone aside from yourself. True. Um, what do you remember about that day eight years ago? Um, I remember, first of all, I remember the two weeks leading up to it. Because okay, tell me it about <laughs> these two weeks. I was really like, okay, I, I have a plan. Yeah. Like everybody asked me like, when you quit your job, like how did you do it? And I was just like, I had such a plan in my head because mm -hmm. I, I was like, I have to find stability in this. And at the time, I was just like I said, I was doing side gigs. Yeah. I was working with agencies. I was mm -hmm. doing like, I was even being like a brand ambassador sometimes. Mm -hmm. You'd give out like t-shirts for a, a Nike event, right? Yeah. So I was like, I talked to everybody I knew first in the creative space, mm -hmm. in music, in culture, in art. Like, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to quit my job. Like, Because I'll never forget it. It was like 20... I want to say it was in 2015 before that. So let's say like January, February. The agency that I had like done freelance stuff for had called me and asked me to shoot something like basketball related. Mm -hmm. And there was a chance that like, I think LeBron or somebody could be there. I could maybe get a photograph of him and I couldn't go mm -hmm. because I was at work. Ooh. I was at my desk Ooh. and I was like, I'm going to have to pass on it. Like there's no way I can make it. So that's when I was like, oh, I got to leave. I like, got to leave. If I'm putting in like the 40 hours here, I could put the 40 hours in there. Like I'm just doing myself a disservice. So I told everybody except my mom mm. first. I told like everybody I knew in this field and they were like, okay, like we'll keep you in mind. Mm. I told Ramya, I told any friend I had. <laughs> and then I told my boss, horrible place, hated it. Mm. And then I was like, I gotta tell my mom. Like I gotta tell my mom like Ooh. a week before. Oh my goodness, you're good. <laughs> You good. I remember when I quit my job, I waited six months before I told my mom. Oh, no. I mean, I couldn't. We, it was just her and I. Yeah. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment. She yeah. was like, what are you doing here? She, You're not she at school? Know. Yeah, she's like, why are you here? <laughs> what are you doing here? So I remember I sat her down, and I was like, okay, I want to tell you something. Mind you, now in the last few years, I've told her a bunch of things. I should, like, I'm dropping out of school, all these things. And then I was like, so I'm going to quit my job. I want to do photography full-time. And she was, I, she was just like, 
okay, mm -hmm. and <laughs> like how like how are you gonna make the money? Like, what's yeah. your plan? And I was like, all I need to do is make sure I make the same amount I make at my job. Yeah. Right now, I make about fourteen hundred dollars every two weeks. Yep. So realistically, I need to make like twenty eight hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. We'll be good. I promise you I can make it. I've spoken to everybody, like I believe it. And she was like, okay, I believe you. She's like, you never have really, when you put your mind to something, you've always done it. Mm. So I believe you, mm. I'm, I support you. And like, she really just encouraged me. Mm. And so then on that sec on July 2nd, I was like, I'm out. I'm out of here. I'm out. I actually like went back to visit. I'm so ridiculous. I wanted to like go back like, hey, I have a <laughs> I'm like a photographer now, but I just left and never looked back. Hmm. And I remember, like, I booked a couple things prior to that day, yep. like so you some had event some stuff. some stuff. Yeah, but it was all stuff that I like. It was a lot of event photography, mm. a lot of like, uh, can you shoot my son's first birthday party? Mm. Can you do these headshots for me? Yep. Can you shoot this after party mm. for this liquor brand? Like, it wasn't really creatively driven. Mm. It was just busy photography yeah, work. Yeah, commercial that I was doing. kind of marketing stuff. You're like, yeah. it paid the bills, but it doesn't it sound paid like the bills. it was because like even music, all, most of like the concert stuff I shot, I wasn't paid for. I was just at the event, mm. or I got a media pass. Mm. It wasn't paid. Like the first time I feel like I got paid for music photography was when I did Purple Rain, like Future's Purple Rain tour. That was the first That's time. The first time. Mm -hmm. Tell so tell me about what was it about taking those gigs that you were like. I know I'm not getting paid, but I'm, I'm going to take these gigs music? because there's a the music gigs. Yeah, like any gig that you didn't get paid for or even if it wasn't a ton of pay, because there is a lot of conversation right now where it feels like folks are apprehensive about going to do things um, if they're not getting paid for it. And I'm just curious to know if you have an opinion on it. Well, it's tough because I feel like we as each generation grows and makes it easier. It's like. Hmm. I did unpaid work so that you would get work that was <laughs> where you got paid and compensated for. But I don't regret it, if that's the question. I think every opportunity for me was like, well, what what is the best thing that can come from this? Yeah. I can get a photo of the said artist or the talent or whatever. Mm. I was just, you know, I was kind of putting in my own like 10,000 hours in a way. Yeah. And a lot of it was just stuff I wanted to shoot. So I was mm. like, if I really want to take a picture of this person, and this is my only opportunity, then I don't really care about it being paid. But also, it was like social media was really starting to grow in how you shared stuff. Because like now you're like peak Tumblr, like mm -hmm. Tumblr, and like Twitter starting to boom, mm. and like you can show pictures on Twitter, yeah. and Instagram is there. So for me, it was also like, oh, if I take this picture of such and such, and I post it on my social media. It's gonna drive like, mm. like even likes were becoming like a, a thing, thing. <laughs> right? So I would like instantly get the photo up because my camera had Wi-Fi, and mm -hmm. then like everybody was talking about it, and then I would get followers, and yeah. then it would lead to somebody else asking me mm. to shoot an event or something. So in my head, it was all, all of it was getting me money somehow. It yeah. just wasn't getting me money directly. Directly, you were like, I'm gonna figure this out though. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll get this picture, and then somebody will hire me for this event because mm. they saw this picture. And that's kind of why I did it. At what point did you go from kind of more of the event photography space to being in spaces where you felt like it was more creatively driven and you were able to kind of step in and be more direct, director hmm. slash, you know, capturing like? I think so. If I started like taking, if I quit my job 2015, I would say by like 20, I mean, really 2016, 2017, wow. it started to be like, all right, more portrait stuff or hmm. like less event. I was still kind of doing event yes. stuff. I think after like, maybe like 2017, 2018, it was like, no. Yeah. And even still, I still will do personal stuff, mm -hmm. depending on who it is or what it is or if I want to do it. Yeah. But I really started to ask myself, like, who am I and like, what do I want to shoot? And that was like a internal mm. struggle that I went through for a long time. I would say up until the pandemic, honestly. Mm. Like when I did my personal project and the BS4, I feel like that was like a rebirth for me, hmm. being okay with like how I define myself as a photographer. Because when I looked at a lot of my bodies of work, it was like, there is a lot of event stuff and stuff I don't love in the beginning. And like conceptual stuff might lack in some ways or like, hmm. I didn't have this. So I started being like, well, I need to do this. I need to do editorial stuff. Well, I want to shoot an album cover. Hmm. All right, well, I want to do a portrait of somebody getting ready. Like, oh, now I want to tell a story. Hmm. So because I was so hard on myself about like what kind of photographer I was because mm. of the work I was doing, I felt like 
it pushed me to want to do the stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to do. Because I feel like when people hire photographers, a lot mm -hmm. of times, they hire them based off of everything they've seen. They've like seen they don't think they're not, capable. Yeah, they don't have a conversation with where, where your head's at or where, right. where you're capable Which of. leads me back to always wanting to talk to people because I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, let's say I want to shoot this perfume campaign. Yeah. You've never seen me do a me perfume. Do that before. Yeah. You're gonna be like, oh, I'm not gonna hire her. She can't do it. Hmm. How do you know I can't do it, hmm. right? But you, it's also a risk, so it's like, I started to ask myself, like, and I think you ask photographers, like, well, what's your niche? Like, what are you known for? Mm. And I was asking myself those questions, and I was just like, I'm just known for bringing the best out of people. Mm. I take a really good photo of you. I mm. want it to feel like your mom took it. Mm. Like, someone that really knows you really took this you. photo and wow. gets you, and it's like, the essence of you is in it, and mm. that's important to me. Yeah, totally. Or like, beyond just the medium or the mm. color, you know? So. I started asking myself those questions and yeah. I felt like, then I started saying no to things because mm. I felt like they didn't fit that. Mm. And I also felt like for me, event photography was like intrusive and impersonal. Like mm. I can take a great candy shop with my eyes closed, but like I wanna talk to you. I wanna yeah. direct you. Yeah. I have a vision for you. I want, it, I want it to just be my photo. I don't wanna take a photo that there's like 20 people taking that yeah. photo. So yeah. those things were like brewing in me as I was mm -hmm. growing mm -hmm. and then I was like, all right, well I don't wanna do this work. So then I would do free work as well mm. that fit what Where I wanted, wanted to, to do. And even to this day, if I believe in something and the budget isn't, isn't ideal, I'll say like, okay, well, what's like the opportunity cost of this? Is it something that could help me in the long run? Is mm. it something that I want to do? Mm. And then I, I'll tend to do it. You tend to do it. I, 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 I love that perspective because you can't, sometimes you have to build the runway. Right. It's not always going to be That's there initially. <laughs> you got you to gotta build it sometimes. Was it hard for you to say no, though, to sometimes like that, that money? Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. why I had to get a manager. <laughs> because one, I didn't know how to say no. Yeah. Two, I didn't know how to put a value to my work. To this day, I still don't, probably don't know how to put a value to my work. And three, I wanted to separate, it's really important to separate the art from like the financial aspect of it yeah. as the artist. Mm. I think that it's hard for me to say to somebody, well, I think it's worth this, or I, this is how much it costs. And I also think that people, underestimate how much actual work goes into what we're doing. Yes. Because you see us click a photo and you're mm -hmm. like, I could do that. But it's not that. It's not that. It's the work leading up to it. It's the work of directing the person. Mm -hmm. It's the post work that comes. Mm -hmm. It's selections. Yeah. It's all of these things. It's also things. people skills. Like you right. gotta make sure they feel like they're comfortable right. with you to even give you something. You have to know capture. it's timing. <laughs> it's a culmination of all these things that I've worked really hard at up mm -hmm. until this point to get me here. Yeah. And so you're like understanding your worth in that aspect and then understanding when it comes to photography, what is that work generating for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Like I take a photo of you, let's say, in this sweater mm -hmm. and this that brings you millions of dollars. Isn't that photo worth more than, worth you know, more, $500 more than that you paid pay a photographer? Yeah. So yeah. I think I was learning that, mm -hmm. I had a great, manager to help me learn that together and we were learning it together and so I was like okay I can separate this so mm -hmm. now when you meet me you're not thinking about mm -hmm. how much you're paying for it you're kind of just like vibing and yeah. we're talking and I'm shooting you and then you love the photo and then you get the email <laughs> you like then you get that invoice but we also but I also am so self-aware that I want to make sure that you feel like you mm -hmm. paid for what you got and you got for what, what you paid for. Mm. So I think that's another thing nowadays. It's like, okay, you have to deliver. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. as consumers, we know we pay for things sometimes and we don't get what we, what we right. thought we paid for. <laughs> right. So I'm like, all right, well, I want to be very good yeah. because you're paying this. Mm. And this is why. This is the experience that comes with working with me. Wow. Like, I want you to be happy mm -hmm. and I want you to feel like you got your money's worth. Yeah. I love that. I mean, but also it's like, I don't know how you'd be where you are if you didn't care about the experience and the quality of the work. Like, you, Thank you, you. You, you, you have to. What? Well, Oh, oh go sorry. Ahead, go no, ahead. no, no, no. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you because I'm curious. Like you, you spoke so much about kind of that intentionality. I want to know what's it like to be on set with you. <laughs> like what's um, it like? I think what's it's a great. Day in that experience. <laughs> like I think it's grown a lot. Yeah. I think that as I become se more self-aware as like a woman and a person and an artist, I give better direction. Mm. Like mm. I can tell you now exactly what I'm looking for. I'm not as shy. Yeah. I am comfortable in working with you and 
and give and like pushing you as well as pushing myself. Mm -hmm. I feel like I take more creative risks. I care about the music, yeah. the environment, um, the positive affirmations around. I'm very mm -hmm. intentional with my team, who I have on set, yeah. how we communicate with each other, how mm -hmm. we communicate with the talent or the company or the brand. It's mm -hmm. like all of those things are so as important as the photo. Yeah. Because I've been in situations like where I'm being photographed and I'm like, this is not a good vibe. Yeah, I don't feel it. And being on camera is hard. Mm. And I think the hardest part is like not having that self-awareness that someone, no matter who they are, what they do for a living, they're still human and they're, they're uncomfortable and mm -hmm. they're a little insecure. So yeah. it's like, make it fun, mm -hmm. make it happy. Mm -hmm. You know, like let the person forget that there's cameras, cameras on set. Cameras like right. all in their grill. <laughs> and like, I'm there like, uh, what are you gonna do? <laughs> so I think in, in, I think it's, a good time, yeah. I would say. That's like, you know, the night before, I'm like, what are we gonna play? Like, what's the music? Mm. My team is great. Everybody I work with, I feel like, has good energy. Mm. And I think it helps make whoever I'm sense. shooting feel comfortable. I'm trying to be on set. <laughs> Let's shoot this letter. Um, talk to me about, um, you mentioned social media, and you mentioned how you were starting to leverage it to, to get to where you wanted to go. Um, and I want to talk about the moment around how you leverage social media to land on Jay-Z and Beyonce's On The Run <laughs> 2 tour. Because um, I'm a big fan of like, if you don't put it out there, right? Right? it's like, how anybody gonna know? Well, I think I have a superpower. People will attest that I do because I, my manifestation game is strong. <laughs> yeah. It blows me away. Some, sometimes I'm like, okay, Raven, like stop <laughs> thinking that because it has come true. Um, but I think if you asked me, I'm sure, I mean, people have asked me. I feel like if I, I reread like a Fader interview I did in like, mm -hmm. I don't, I felt like it was like maybe like 2015, 2016. They're like, well, who do you want to shoot? Like, what's mm -hmm. on your bucket list? Mm -hmm. And I would always be like, Beyonce, Beyonce, Jay Z. Um, and at the time, when I wrote the, the tweet, I, I can't even remember when I wrote it. Yeah. Like, I, I just wrote it you one day. Like, I was like, man, this tour is insane. I wish I could photograph it. Like, and I just left it. I forgot about it. But I think I was always working towards my bucket list. Mm. You know? I, yeah, you, you weren't, it wasn't an empty thing. No. You were still, you were working towards something. You had right. a body of work. I believe that, like, the, preci the precision of language and your words matter. And mm -hmm. what you say really matters. So especially with Twitter, I never, one, I never wanted to tweet things where I was like, whoa, I said that. But also, I would say things that I wanted just to talk about it, just to, like, let people know this is what I was thinking mm -hmm. or this is what I was feeling. Because I really felt, I really have, like, a personal relationship with social media. And, mm -hmm. like, I wanted to feel genuine to myself. So I felt like I said it, didn't think about mm -hmm. it. And then... <laughs> In 2017, I was at Made in America, yeah. and I had a pass to shoot stuff, but I couldn't shoot Jay's set. Like, it was just closed off. He only let, like, Kevin Mazur and maybe, like, two other people shoot it. Oh, wow. So, um, so I couldn't, like, I you couldn't. You really, literally could not capture it. Well, not from the pit. Yeah. I could capture it from the festival space, which yeah. is what I did. I, like, had my camera. I had a 20 four to 70 lens on me and that was it. And I was in the crowd. It's a mm. great story. Mm. So I'm shooting, the guy next to me, um, who I know is like, he has a 70 to 200 lens, mm -hmm. zoom lens. And he's like, you wanna use it? Like I see you, like you're really into it, taking pictures. I'm like, sure. He <laughs> lends me his lens. So I get like some zoomed in shots. A little more zoomed in, nothing crazy. Yeah. And I immediately, right after the set, put it on the internet. So, I like put it on a tweet and I'm like, Hove, put me in the pit next time. Again, thinking I'm being clever and yeah. witty, not thinking anything of it. Yeah. At this point though, I've like, I had photographed him at like Elliot Wilson's birthday party. Mm -hmm. I had like, you know, gotten a photo of him like at Made in America walking, but I had never like been in the pit yeah. shooting him. And like, I remember like Guru wrote, texted me and was like, Jay saw your photos, he like loves them. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Crazy. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and then um, Lenny texted me and was like, wow. Jay saw your photo. And I was like, oh my God. And then he was like, yo, he put this in an email. And like the email was like, he was doing Meadows Festival mm -hmm. in Queens next after mm -hmm. Made in America. And he was like, tell her like, Queens up next. I'll see her in the pit. Wow. And I was like, blown away. <laughs> Um, just amazing and 
so then I shot Meadows. Yeah. And I was like in the pit, like, <laughs> and he like was like, he like point, it was just crazy. <laughs> and they were like, this was like four for four, it just came out. Yeah. Um, so I did that. And then he had the 444 tour. He was like going through the tour. He got to the New York stop, which was like kind of halfway through mark of mm -hmm. the tour. And um, his publicist, Jana, she gave me a working pass. Like, hey, he wants you to shoot the show, like come out. So I shot that and I remember I shot it very wide. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a lot of intimate shots. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show the set. Yeah. And she called me the next day and was like, he really loved that you captured Intimate. wide stuff. It wasn't just about him. Mm -hmm. It was like about the tour as a whole. So she was like, can you come on for the rest of the tour? And I was like, yeah, when? She was like, tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like, okay. So I did the rest of that tour. Wait, so wait, 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 wait. You, the next day? Yep, I went to DC. Packed my stuff and went to DC. Oh my goodness. It was gonna be like two more weeks of the tour, but two, maybe three, maybe like three more weeks. Yeah. And then I finished the tour out and I was like, and it was just life changing. And then from there, hmm. I photographed him and Beyonce and mm -hmm. then I shot Coachella for her and yeah. then I did OTR2 as a whole. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just, so then I'm on OTR2 yeah. and yeah. someone like retweets my tweet, like, remember you said this? and. I, and on that day, I was like in Europe, we were like in Rome. I took this really iconic photo of them that I loved. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is such a full circle moment. Mm -hmm. Wow, my words are real. But yeah. also like all this work leading up to this brought me here. Brought you here. And <laughs> for me, it's like, I mean, I'm from New York. Like yeah. these are the people I grew up on. This is the music I love mm -hmm. and listen to that like, you know, my work ethic is inspired mm. by them, like my creativity in a lot of ways. So they were always on my bucket list, but also it was like, wow, mm. like now what? Yeah. Like, now I, who am I? Like who, what kind of, like what do I do next? Mm. You know? I think seeing them and working with so many artists that work on such a high level of success really motivated me. Mm. It so, pushes you, right? Yes, because I'm like the work you guys do and how you work, like I want to be that in my field. Right. Like, I want to work as hard. I want to be, like, they're so intentional mm -hmm. and they really are paying attention to every element and detail of their work. And mm -hmm. I was like, I need to take that for myself mm -hmm. and do that. Mm -hmm. And how do I do that? What do you feel like you learned from being with Jay-Z and Beyonce on the run to tour? What did you pick up from them uh, from a work ethic standpoint, a creative standpoint that you, that you think about even today when you go into different projects? I learned how to work on the highest level at all times. Like mm. for me, it's like, it doesn't matter about the last show. It's like the next show and being present in that show and like delivering the, how do you one, deliver your best work every single time? Yeah. And how do you make a situation look different, right? Mm. Cause it's the same show. Like the, the outfit changes and like the place changes, but like I, it challenged me to think outside the box in all elements of photography, not just mm. music on how can I shoot this differently? What is my story? Like, mm. what's my perspective? I was very conscious of like, what is my perspective, you know? Yeah. Um, and how can I tell that story in this? Like, what is the story of the tour? Mm. And for me, it was like love and mm. family and people yeah. and like being black and yeah. being on this tour. So yeah. that really challenged me, but also seeing like what I think are like the best entertainers performing at the highest level, I was like, well, every day I have to have the best photo. <laughs> like my photo has to be the has one be the that you're like, I love that photo. <laughs> I want to recreate that photo. And so I challenged myself and it was hard. Wow. I was, it was the first time I had went overseas, mm. like really traveled in general in America and Europe. Yeah. I was basically mm. like by myself, away from my mom, like leaving the Bronx. Yeah. Like it was a big, for five months. So I learned about myself, I became mm. more independent. I started, that was the first time I was like, well, who am I as a photographer? Wow. And it was really eye-opening. Huh. It was hard. I mean, I, I have to imagine, like you're on the road that amount of time, you gotta try to take care of yourself, but you gotta try to be at this, at this level. How are you dealing with whatever's happening in your head, right? Like, are you facing anxiety? Are you facing questioning, like, what the hell am I doing out here? Like, what's going on in, in your head? I think, I didn't think I had like imposter syndrome, but I think that I definitely, it made me way more self-conscious about who I, who I wanted to be as a photographer. Mm. Because I felt like 
there were like a lot of eyes on me. Yeah. And then I think more so mentally, I endured that once I was done. Because <laughs> now you have so many people, like when you are, and I think this is for a lot of photographers, when you're tied, especially in celebrity work, when you're tied to celebrities, that's what people look at you as, mm -hmm. right? That's what they ask you about. Mm -hmm. They assume that you're completely, like the, you're their photographer when you're hired for a job. Yeah. I'm not gonna shoot everything you might do, but then it becomes like, well then who are you, hmm. right? I wanted people to know me, you. Raven, as a photographer, not yeah. just like, you shoot Jay-Z and Beyonce, or before that it was like, you shoot Future, or before mm -hmm. that it was like, you shoot Big Sean. It yeah. was like, well no, I, I photograph all of these people, but I want you to know me mm. as a photographer. But then I was like, well who am I? <laughs> and I was really depressed when wow. I came off tour because that high of people, mm talking about your work, wanting to, you know, everybody wants to get next to you. Yeah. Everybody wants to use your work. Yeah. Everybody's like, you're the best at yeah. this and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, okay, but I want you to love my photos of regular people. Yeah. I want you to love my photos that are editorial. Mm. I want you to have that same reaction to a photo I take of my cat. Mm. Like, you know, <laughs> and I was like very self-aware about like, well, if I don't shoot them again, let's say, do people, care? do people care? Or like, how do I get away from just like people are like, well, she's a tour photographer. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And like, to the point that I would like tell my manager, like, we have to change this verbiage when people interview me, or we mm -hmm. have to cut that out, or I don't even want to talk about, about the tour. This at all. I don't want to talk <laughs> about them. Don't mention yeah. any celebrities. <laughs> Take out celebrity photographer because I was self-conscious about it. Mm. And I was like, this isn't healthy. Mm. Like, I have to know who I am as a mm. as an artist. Yeah. So that when I go out into the world, it doesn't matter who you tie me with. Because I know who I am. Because you know who you are at the end of the day. So that was my, like, self-discovery. <laughs> <laughs> right before I turned 30. Yeah. I mean, but it's a part of it, right? Like, don't get me wrong. You Like, it's great to have the, the highs, but you do, you know, sometimes it's just natural to wonder, like, I don't want that to only be the thing that that's my story. But I, to your point, I was like, I guess that's the work that you got to do. Right. And it's also yourself. like you shouldn't feel that way either. Right. Mm -hmm. I think consumers mm -hmm. have to work on it, too, where yeah. you can separate the art from the artist and still love that. Like, I love that I've had the opportunity to, to shoot all of these iconic people that inspire me. It feels like I'm reciprocating mm -hmm. art back to them with the art they give me. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you give me music or you give me sports. Or you you're an amazing actor. You made my favorite movie. And mm -hmm. then I give you this back. This is my art. This is my art. Back to you. But. Also, like, I'm a person just like they're a person mm -hmm. and, like, separate it. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to just be tied to your work, mm -hmm. you know? That was the other thing I learned. You can like, decouple them. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, there's a lot of elements to me besides my photography yeah. that I want you to know. Wow. That's a big one. That's a big one to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> Take me, have you taken time to really think about, like, when we look back 20 years from now, you've captured so many different moments in culture um have you thought about like how you're gonna feel about that and what you think about when you're like talking to younger photographers about these moments or other people about these cultural moments sometimes well yeah. one it's like i feel really blessed but i also tell younger photographers that like in those moments sometimes you don't get to see the full story till later hmm. so it's like for me, some like in 2010, let's say, shooting a photo of like MMG, mm. it was just present then. But now I look back and I'm like, wow, that was one of the first photos of them as a group. That's mm. so massive. Or this is the last time these people were together. Wow. Or like this moment was so important to like culture, but I didn't realize it then. It was happening. So I think understanding that sometimes you don't see the full picture till later and that being mm. so important. But also like we kind of define history. Like we're, <laughs> we are laying out like the visual history for people to yes. look back on and say this it, like this happened and we existed in this time right. and so I don't take it for granted and I also try to remember that when I'm capturing people like I want them to be in a positive light and be showing like for me joy and mm -hmm. like the positive of that moment mm -hmm. so I don't know it's a lot of responsibility I think I think being a photographer is a lot of responsibility I think I value people's privacy mm. And so I'm very intentional about my selects, what I pick, I, what I don't use, what mm -hmm. I never ask to use, uh, because I feel like I'm just a vessel for that moment. For that moment, and for what 
needs to be shown to the public and what right. doesn't need yeah. to be shown. Yeah, like there's some parts of a process that I think are important later. Hmm. There are so many photos I've taken that people have never seen, hmm. and they might come out, they you might, know? They yeah. might come out in 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. That person might be like, hey, I remember you took this photo 20 years ago. I want to use it for a doc. So understanding mm. that like everything doesn't have to come out in real time mm. is important, especially it's ironic for me because mm. my career was kind of built in like posting in real time. In real time, yeah. <laughs> That's another thing Toy taught me. Like, there are things that just don't make it out <laughs> that are crazy You're like, or amazing. Crazy. I'm like, oh my God, this is insane. But there's beauty in that too. Like, there's mm. beauty in the work that you do that people don't see because mm. you learn. Mm. And then there's beauty in the stuff you do select and like how people get to ingest that and mm. experience it. So I think I, I'm i still so much of like living in it, yep. I don't sometimes even realize what I'm capturing. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, it's another day. It's another day. What's, how do you uh, go about fostering this comfort and these relationships with folks that you work with, right? Because to your point, like it is like, it is a relationship. Um, it is a conversation. It's um, you're working on this together, even if they're sitting opposite side and you're the one, you know, taking the photo. Um, I think that the number one thing I would say is that it's my empathy and the fact that I value privacy and mm -hmm. I look at all people as human beings, Humans. not what they do, because I think at a base level, I want my privacy. I don't want a bad photo of me up. There might be some that's really great, but I just don't want to share it. Like yeah. I, I value the relationship I have with mm -hmm. it in private. So because of that, I feel like I can be a fly on the wall in these spaces. I'm not thirsty mm -hmm. to get stuff out. Like I said, it, there's so many photos I've taken that people don't see. They have them and they love them and that's just that's is what at. it is. Yeah. I think a lot of times you see people like, I got this photo, the person looks crazy. Yeah. And it, that, hurts the next generation, yeah. right? The reason that sometimes people can't be in a photo pit is because somebody has taken a bad photo of them and now they're like, no, no, no one can take no a photo of No one's in here. Me. <laughs> because you abused your access and you made me uncomfortable and now I don't want anybody in that space. And that holds mm. back the younger kid who wants to take a good photo, right? So it's like, I know I can't be everywhere at once and one day I'm gonna have to recommend somebody mm. or do something and I want to make sure that the next person I recommend understands the element of privacy and values that for that and treats mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. like they're a human. Like, how are you? Do you want to take a picture do today? Do you even want to do that today? Yeah, like sometimes I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, do you want me in here? Mm -hmm. Like, I can come back or how much time do you have? It's just mm -hmm. little things All like, nuances. yeah, you feeling it? You're yeah. not feeling it? Okay, I see you're not feeling it. So what do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to play music? <laughs> I know you don't want to be here. I want to be here, but sometimes I don't want to be here either. So yeah. like, how can we make it work for both of us? Mm. I think that has cultivated a lot of really great relationships and people can trust me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm fun. Yeah, I mean, I think you want to be friends with fun me. And trust is like, it's important. It's like, you want to be friends with me. <laughs> I'd want to be friends with me. <laughs> well, we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> we're in this now. And then it's like, and then you, and then my product mm. you like. Right? Yeah. Then the last part of it is that you see a photo is good, yeah. you feel good, so you trust me in mm. your space. Hmm. What about the part where the money comes into play, right? How do you get comfortable, like in your early days, like now it's, I understand it's, it's, it's separated, right? You're, you're out of that process, but how do you get comfortable with your value and, and asking for your value? Because um, you had spoken a little bit about like, Sometimes folks don't realize all the work that goes into that. Right. So how did you get comfortable with like, this is my price? <laughs> I mean, sometimes this is my price and it doesn't work out. I hmm. think that I've also been, one, I do, like I said, I think Rami and I have a, a very unique working relationship of like talking about things to each other, hmm. like measuring out. Sometimes I'll be like, hey, I want to do this. This person is not going to pay me this amount of money that I'm worth, but I really want to do it. And she'll be like, you sure? <laughs> All right, I'll ask for that. And like that push and pull of us understanding, like she had to teach me like, no, this is where it's going. But mm. also like, I think a lot of talent, they have people that deal with money. So like, we are not talking money. Mm. Their team and my team is discussing money. But in the early days when you don't have that, you just have to take a risk. Yeah. And I think you have to be okay that people will say no, mm. because it might not be for you. Mm -hmm. 
And you have to also be okay with saying no if it doesn't work for you. Mm. Like, I've had younger photographers call me in the last few years and be like, hey, can you help me? And I'm like, sure. Yeah. Ask for more. There is more money to be made. Trust <laughs> me. Trust me. The, the offer they give you, it could probably go a little higher. But a lot of times you'll be like, hey, like, let's, uh, let's just throw out a number. Like, let's say they're like, hey, we want you to do this job for $1,000. And the job is really like a $5,000 mm -hmm. job. And you say, hey, well, like, what this is worth, like, what I'm going to be doing, what you're using it for, is really, like, worth $5,000. They might be like, all right, well, to be honest, like, this is the budget, but we'll come back with something if you do this job, and the mm -hmm. next job might open up. But we really want you to do we really it. We really want you. And then you start that relationship however, and then however it grows, it grows. Yeah. I think every situation is unique, mm. but I think you have to be okay with asking for more. But I also sometimes have to be like, okay, if I take this job and it's not a lot of money, am I gonna be mad at myself? Like, am I gonna be home on Photoshop like? I don't wanna do this, right? Right. If that's the case, then I probably shouldn't do it. Because the quality of it is not gonna be mm. good either. And then you mess up your future money. Then you mess up your future money. So it's like, <laughs> a lot of honest conversations with yourself but mm. then sometimes like you might be in a space where you need to take that job like you need to make ends meet so mm. take it yeah like uh, there's stuff i've shot that like didn't do anything for me but like but get me paid i got paid and i ate <laughs> and i'm cool <laughs> yeah. and it didn't hold me back yeah years later yeah. so i think as long as it doesn't mess up who you are like who you actually are and like there's still a sense of integrity then i think you can do it hmm. but i think you have to ask yourself those questions and then you have to push to ask for more yeah that's brilliant um you've expanded beyond just photography i um, have you've gotten into directing videos and doing other things but take me into this process around um directing music videos i saw the work that you did with rory and like it's super beautiful thank you um what are the overlaps there um, between the stills and now getting to movement and, and motion? For me, the evolution of be going from being a photographer to being a director mm -hmm. is really linear because I want to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And now I have more of a desire to tell longer mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. I want to give you more than these a thousand words in this picture. So it was like, I want to evoke emotions. I want people mm. to sit with my work. I want it to be tangible. And I think sometimes mm. directing for me is in the next level for that storytelling. So I had already felt comfortable giving direction and, and I'm on set and like we, there's like a whole film team for like the, the motion part of it. And I'm like, I could do this. Like <laughs> I have the vision, like I, and I have a creative story, but I also think I turned 30 mm -hmm. and I was like, what is the next 10 years of my life gonna mm. look like? Because the first 10 years was me, the first decade in my 20s was like becoming a photographer, building my name, like building myself also as a brand kind of outside of just photography. But I was like, what's my purpose, right? Mm. Like in, in 2019 after the tour, I'm like asking myself those questions. So I was like, well, I wanna tell stories. Yeah. I wanna, write a movie one day, I wanna direct a movie, I wanna direct a TV show that people mm. binge watch. Mm. I wanna work with kids, yeah. I wanna start a nonprofit, yeah. I wanna be in commercials, mm. you know? So I was like, what's my new bucket list? And yeah. that was on the top of my bucket list. Wow. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I wanna direct something. Wanna direct like something. always, I'm like, hey Rom, like, what, what's our plan? <laughs> like, because I need a thought, I need like a, a thinking partner. Yeah, a thought I partner am, always helps. Always, yeah. and I am like a collaborative girl, mm. okay? I like teamwork. <laughs> I wanna hire everybody there to do what they're good at, because yeah. it helps me. I don't wanna do everything, mm. and I'm cool with that. I'm not like greedy in that sense, especially creatively, so I'm just like, She's like, well, what do you want to do? She's always asking me, what do you want to do next? What do you want to do next? And sometimes I'm like, chill, I don't know. Yeah. But when I do know, I'll tell her. I'll tell her. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well, I want to start a nonprofit mm. and I want to direct mm. and I want to do bigger jobs. I want to be more front facing. I want people to get to know me and what mm. I'm passionate about. And that's kind of what I've, you know, started to, started to do. Uh -huh. And then, like, really, you know, my mom was getting sick and, mm. like, I wanted her to see, like, other things I wanted to do, yeah. you know? I felt like I was even pushed even more to mm. like go after the things I wanted. I started to like feel, I don't want to get too emotional, but I started to feel like, okay, what is my purpose? Like mm. I want her to be so proud. She's already proud of me, but I want her to see me yeah. fulfilling this. And then when she passed, I was like, oh my God, like I have to go all in. Mm. Like now 
there's like a space in my heart and life where I have to fulfill it. So like, yeah. let me like go all into the projects and the things I want to do because that's fulfilling for me. Like that's how I that's like how carry do. on mm. her love and her legacy. Like all these things that she'd be like, oh, do it. Mm. Oh, you're gonna get, you're gonna direct a movie. Like you'll win an Oscar one day. Mm. You'll win an Emmy or like, oh my God, are you gonna start an, an after school? Are you gonna work with kids? Like we'd have those conversations. Wow. So I was like, okay, yeah. I'm gonna do I feel it. part of it is, you know, my, my father passed away, um, I think 11 years ago now. And I think when you think about the work that you do, a part of it is like, it's so dope to think like, I bet they're like, wow, you're getting to do these things that I only had dreams of doing. Right. And it's like, it's also like you feel like a responsibility and like you don't want to waste your opportunities, right. you know, because Absolutely. like the things they sacrifice and things they couldn't do. Um, so I, I totally hear you. It puts you in a place where you really want to, it's not like, I don't think of it in a way of like, I have to do it, but it's more so like, I really want to do it because I know that they would be happy about it. Right, you know? I feel like, I was watching the new Spider-Man, mm. and there's the part where they're just saying like every like every super every Spider-Man right experiences a loss, and that mm. loss transcends you into being your like the superhero you are. And mm -hmm. I feel like when you have such a massive loss with somebody that's like every every time I've spoken about my mom, I'm like she's my muse, she's like mm. my inspiration, yeah. she's like the foundation of why I do what I do. Mm. Now this person lives in you. Yeah. So now it's even more of a push. It's mm. even more of an inspiration. It's like, oh, like I got you and me? Mm. What, what's holding me back? Like yeah. there's nothing I can't do if you got me. <laughs> if in, you got me. <laughs> yeah, like, you got me up there. <laughs> then you got me down here. Like I could do it. And I think that that's personally even for my own grief journey how I find mm. the beauty in it. Mm. And it's like I feel good every time I do something new now. I'm not scared to check things off. Like mm. I'll be like, oh, I'm. I, I could do this. Yeah. Like, I'm not nervous. Like, I could hear you in my head telling me, like, go after it, go after mm. it, go after it. And that puts me at ease. Wow. Versus I would feel so bad if, like, you're not here and I'm not going after the things I want. Like, how yeah. selfish is that? That you're, I'm on this planet living healthy and I'm not going after things because of what? Fear? Because I'm scared that someone's going to say no? Because I'm scared it's not going to be good? Like, I'm sure I'm going to make things that are bad. I'm positive not a lot of things but there's gonna be something I make that's bad but it's like I did it like you can't judge somebody that goes after what they want and like executes it it doesn't matter hmm. the quality sometimes of it because that person was like you know what I'm not gonna let fear hold me back yeah. and so that's kind of what I what? use to motivate use that's like my mirror speech in the morning ah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that I love that Tell me about you mentioned the foundation, right? Um, and 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 I and I see I see the I see some swag. So here. I'll give you my tie-in, my okay. uh, umbrella of yes, who I am. Yes, yes, yes. So and the B is four was like a personal project I did in 2020. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to drop two weeks before the pandemic started and ended up dropping in November. So it was like my personal love letter to the Bronx. It was me documenting my friends, family, and people that worked in my community. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, telling a story of like making them feel like it was an editorial piece yeah. and feel good, mm -hmm. but also like making them larger than life to show what has inspired me. Like yeah. this melting pot of individuals is what has shaped me mm -hmm. into who I am. So that's where, and my name is Raven B. Verona. Mm -hmm. My mom didn't give me a middle name. Mm -hmm. It's just an initial. It's so just it's an initial. just B. Huh. And it's like, what's it for, right? Like, <laughs> everybody asks me, like, what does the B stand for? Or like, what's your middle name? I'm like, it, I don't have a middle name. It's B. So I was like, oh, this is cool because it could stand for all the things that inspire mm. me. It could stand for being black. It could stand for being from the Bronx. Mm. It could, you know, it could be for your name. It could be for anything, right? Yeah. So I was like, I think this is a really cool play on words and mm. it defines me. So let's like go for it. So yeah. that's where the name came from. So my merch has and the B is for. Mm -hmm. And then I've always said to people, like, I know your best side. Mm. Like, I know your best side. Mm. I know, B is for best side. Like, <laughs> so when I started the nonprofit, uh, I wanted to call it Best Side best Foundation. Side. Uh, so it's like Best Side Foundation is the nonprofit yeah. and the B is for is just like my personal brand. brand. If I want to make home goods, if I want to make clothes, yeah. I want to sell prints. Yeah. All of that is under and the B is four, but best side and B and the B is four are like the umbrella. Umbrella, of and they me. work together. And they work together. Uh, on that, on the exhibit side, personal side, you, do you plan on doing more of that? I do. Yeah. I mean, 
we have an internal deadline for us that we should do something this year. <laughs> Will that happen? I don't know. I think I'm deciding what is the next story under that umbrella because mm -hmm. I do want another volume of it. Yeah. So yeah, so you've been working on these different projects. Do you have any plans for a future project, exhibit, etc.? Yeah, so like internally, mm -hmm. <laughs> we did want to do another personal story and another personal project this year. Yeah. Will that happen? Ideally. I think for me, it's about when I did end the BS4, like the first volume of it, I really flushed it out as mm -hmm. I was doing it. Like yeah. how it started wasn't like where it got to. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of self discovery in between, in between. that to make it. Yeah. So for me, I'm like, what is the next story under End the BS4? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it defined for me? What story do I want to tell? Is it about the Bronx again? Yeah. Is it a bigger story about the Bronx? Mm -hmm. Is it something in motion about the Bronx? Mm. Is it a movie I want to make about the Bronx? Yeah. You know, like I'm asking myself all of those questions because I do want it to be thematic and mm. I want it to feel like the next stage of End the Bee is for. But it's also merch, you know? Yeah. Right now it's yeah. merch stuff. It's yeah. like making sweatsuits and making candles and I want to make a beach blanket mm. and I. It's about like my own personal work for prints. Like yeah. everyone's always like, sell prints, sell prints, sell prints. So I'm like, well, what do you want prints of? Because I'm not selling you celebrity prints. No, yeah. So what do you want? What do you want? Because on my off time, I want to be on the beach. So mm. there's sunsets and there are palm trees. And it's like the corner store, like, is it that? Hmm. So I'm asking myself those questions. Yeah. Um, and then I think also for personal work, it's like building my own brand mm. as Raven, yeah. you know? It's like, okay, Raven B. Verona. Mm -hmm. It's Ravy B. It's like um, partnerships. Mm. It's like working with brands I believe in, you know? Mm. I just did a partnership with Dyson. Oh, dope. Right? I was yeah. like, I was in a commercial. Oh, yeah. It hasn't come out yet. Ah. I'm very excited. <laughs> but it was very nerve wracking to be in front of the camera and. But I was like, I believe in this product. I They have like a purifying headphone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is so cool. I'm mm. from the Bronx. Like, is it, does it align with me? Mm. You know? So. Yeah, it's got, like, it's, it, it can't just be anything. It all has to be under this umbrella yeah. of who I am as a person. So I want to do more things like that. Like, mm. I want to do more brand partnerships. I want to have my own brand. Yeah. I want to grow Best Side. You know, I think that's, like, my pride and joy mm. because it, gives me, like, it fulfills my direct purpose of helping kids like myself. Yeah. And I just think that there's so much that we can do mm. as creatives mm. with what we have mm. in teaching, like, younger kids and a younger generation how to be creative, yeah. how to be self-aware, how to be comfortable, mm. like, how limitless it is, mm. right? Like, you don't just have to be the talent. You mm -hmm. can set up the mics. Yeah. You can do audio. Yeah. You can do posts. Mm -hmm. You can be like Ramya, like, on a call, making sure things are happening, you know? So I think growing up, I always felt like being creative is a luxury that mm. a lot of people are not afforded to have, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And when you're poor, you don't always have this mental space to think about being creative. No. So if I can alleviate some of that mm. or open that up for kids under best side, then I feel like I'm doing what I'm you're supposed doing to what do. You're supposed to do. I love it though, because you're right. Like so many of us grow up and we don't have that luxury of like the space to do that. But I think as more of us are getting into these spaces, we have to make right. room. We have to create these tables and seats and chairs for the next generation or even our peers, you know, or, or even folks older than us. It doesn't matter, you know, whatever right. age you are. <laughs> like, you know, boomers didn't <laughs> leave us with a lot. But <laughs> I think we are a generation, like we're the generation of kids that grew up before the internet and yes. the first of the internet, yes. like the first of everything. Yep. And so we have the access, we understand what, what it was like before that, mm -hmm. but we also understand that it should be easier because I think we're a generation that has gone through so much. So much, mm -hmm. like we wake up with anxiety, the world is ending <laughs> for us. And we've seen a lot of loss. Yeah. And I think that we're kind of in a space now where we're, we have to create that golden age for the next generation mm -hmm. because my fear is seeing how we've grown up sometimes. Mm -hmm. They are hopeless and mm -hmm. I don't want kids don't to feel hopeless way. and yeah. I don't want their parents to struggle more than they have to. Mm -hmm. And I feel like right now, especially in education, that's mm -hmm. where it's at. Yeah. So if my picture day initiative is just a little glimmer mm -hmm. of like, today was a good day at school and I met this girl and she took my picture and I want to do that later than like I did something fulfilling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's where I'm at that's with where it. You're at. You mentioned 
your time you like to be on the beach right uh, so when you're you're not working and you're not building your foundation and your brand how do you reset how do you rest <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you laughing because it depends the day i mean uh, ideally i like to be on vacation but on a normal day i'm like re-watching the office and like <laughs> making cooking i love to cook yeah. and i love i had to find a lot of passions for myself once Photography, which is my main passion, became my job. So mm -hmm. like, I try to find things that are fulfilling to me, whether it's like cooking for my friends, yeah. having dinner parties, very competitive, so game nights, <laughs> interacting, spades. Spades, <laughs> interacting with people, playing mafia, like, mm -hmm. and then being on the beach and like relaxing. I really like my downtime, and I really believe we as creatives burn out, be especially now because there is this like highlight reel on social media that makes you believe that like none of the work you do matters mm. after you do it and mm. you're constantly like i haven't posted in a week i haven't done this when you like just shot a cover or you just yep. did a world like a commercial mm -hmm. campaign yep. and then like a month later you're like i'm not doing anything because you took a break yeah. and it's like no 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 this is <laughs> like, like this is so weird <laughs> that's so but it's like so, like it's almost like as a creative, I feel like I kind of confined myself in the beginning to like the same mentality of like nine to five, mm -hmm. but it's harder because you're working all the time. Yeah. You're thinking about your job from mm -hmm. the moment you wake up to the moment you sleep. Like I don't check out of being a photographer. Mm -mm. So I had to learn how to check out. Wow. And I have to say like, I'm not gonna work this month. Hmm. I have that luxury, that's a privilege. So I wouldn't say everybody can do it, but as I work harder and I work smarter, hmm. I feel like I have more downtime and that's what I want. Like mm -hmm. that's the purpose of living. It's just to chill and it's not to work. love like and to, laugh yeah. and enjoy life <laughs> and do what you want to do. So yeah. I think, not to ramble, but when the pandemic happened and the world stopped, mm -hmm. we got a lot of downtime. Right. And I felt like I learned a lot about myself. I started meditating. Mm. I started going to therapy. Mm. I started doing all the things you do in LA, I feel like <laughs> <laughs> you move here. But it taught me a lot about myself and what I liked and I felt like my ideas became better. Mm. I can do a mood board way faster. I can make mm. a deck now, mm. but I'm like, I'm gonna sit for a week and yeah, think about and it. And think about it. Before, but now I can bang it out because I have a lot of downtime for myself. Mm. I'm not burnt out. Yeah. So all of my work is so that I don't have to work. Mm. I don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to, I try to be intentional with what I do so that it gives me the space. To do the work that to you do the wanna work do. I want to do. Yeah, no, it's, it's I wish more of us can understand, like, you need the space to recover, and also, your ideas are better. Like, I'm not saying, like, delay no, things are. for 10 years, but I'm saying, like, give yourself the appropriate amount of time. It's true because you're one person, yeah. and your perspective is your, your own, but mm -hmm. you have to live life mm -hmm. to have a perspective, yeah. and you have to, for me personally, if I want to tell stories, I need to be around stories, I need to be inspired, mm -hmm. and, like, I get a lot of inspired. <laughs> From, from relaxing. People. Yeah, from relaxing, yeah. No. From relaxing. That's the time to think. For sure. <laughs> um, your career is continuing to grow. It's going to continue to grow and go beyond what we're even talking about right now, beyond what we can imagine. But when you reflect and you think about this generation coming up that you want to impact and you want to foster, um, what advice would you have for a young photographer or director coming up? My advice for anybody coming up, photography, directing, being creative in general, is that the best thing you can do is create your own blueprint. Hmm. I don't think you need to follow in the footsteps of anybody else. You can be inspired, you can be motivated, but you have to remember to be intentional and that your perspective is unique to you and that is like your gold mine. Like nobody sees the world the way you see it, mm -hmm. so no one is gonna produce what you produce. And if you spend, too much time trying to follow somebody else's blueprint or do it like somebody else or not be secure in your own ideas, you're never gonna get to where you wanna be. Hmm. You know, I didn't, a lot of the things that have made me successful, I learned uh, through myself and hmm. through the people around me and it's unique to us. Yeah. And I didn't see it before. <laughs> and I think filling that void in your own life and in that journey will really, get you to where you want to go. Mm. So I think if you trust your vision, I would tell them to trust their vision. Mm. I would tell them to always ask for more money. <laughs> I would tell them to be comfortable with, you know, not always getting where where they want to go when they think they're going to get there. Mm. Like, you're going to get there. 
if you keep working at it, but it might not be when you think, when you, you, think you need to get there. And I think the biggest thing about like manifesting what you want and the life you want is being intentional with how you talk to yourself. Mm. Like how you talk to yourself when no one's around, it's not what you say in interviews or what you say outwardly. It's like how you talk to yourself and who you believe you are is the most important part. And so I feel like my breakthroughs have always come from being kind to myself. Mm. Being my biggest critic, but also being my biggest cheerleader, like, I did that. Like, yeah. that is a good photo. It's, <laughs> it's, you spend a lot of time being critical of yourself. It's like, would you, would, you wouldn't give that advice to somebody else, right. you know? Like, right. what's the endearing advice you'd give to somebody else? Give that to yourself. Hmm. And foster that relationship, and I think your art will blossom and be a good person. That's mm -hmm. my biggest thing. Be a good fucking person <laughs> because there are a lot of shitty people in this industry and you do not want to be one of them. And I think being a good person and being good to people and people wanting to come back and work with you is what will get you to where you want to be. That was brilliant advice, by the way. Thank you. <laughs>